Dr. Renee Legrade hails from Alaska. She has roots in eastern Washington. Um, she got her BA at Washington State in interior design and furniture design. And in fact, she worked as a designer, but finding that she liked students better than clients, um, she <laughs> came back to academia, where she loves working with students and pushing them out of their comfort zones. Um, and she got her MA in history at Wesleyan University and her PhD at the University of Nebraska, Lincoln. On the subject of her work is women and gender in the American West. Um, at home, Renee has two Irish terriers, Apparently she loves them so much she spends more money on toys for her dogs than she did on toys for her sons, <laughs> which her sons never fail to remind her of. Her favorite superhero is Marvin the Martian. Her most interesting experience is riding in the Grand Parade in an Italian rodeo in Volgara near Milan. Um, her favorite song is Neil Diamond's Brother Love's Traveling Salvation Show, um, and she teaches those lyrics when she's teaching to her, his her history students the Second Great Awakening. Her favorite book is Cormac McCarthy's All the Pretty Horses. So with that background, um, <laughs> let's welcome Renee. She's going to talk about um, Buffalo Bill's legacy, finding the West and Westerners in contemporary Italy. Renee Legrade. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. After that introduction, I, found, I seem kind of odd, don't I? <laughs> anyway, uh, I, I love the slide in this, or the image in this title slide. Uh, two young girls, they're probably, I don't know, six, seven, eight. They look like they're here in the States, don't they? But they're not, they're in Italy. And when I first became aware of the Italian uh, presence, uh, or the, the American West presence in, I in Italy, I was absolutely stunned, and this is how I got into the, the project. So the talk that I'm giving this morning is part of a larger work entitled Our Cowboys Ourselves uh, that uses the, the uh, cowboy image in the U.S. and Italy from 1890 to the present and looks at what the images that we see in Italy kind of say about both countries. But I'd start first with a little bit of a history on how this whole thing, on this whole project unfolded. Um, sometimes people are curious, how did you get into this? Well, uh, my father and grandmother and, and aunt immigrated to the United States in 1952. Uh, they were the only three members of the family that left Italy. And so there's a lot of connection back and forth uh, that when my sisters and I were growing up, we continued the connection. And in 2000, I decided it was time to take my boys to Italy to see their Italian relatives, to meet them for the first time. And so here's our Italian vacation. Um, lots of family, lots of sightseeing. We, we did everything all the tourists do, plus had great meals. We were up in Tortona, uh, where two of my father's cousins live. And um, one of my relatives said, oh, well, what, you know, what is, how's your grad school going? You know, and I said, it's going pretty well. And he said, what's your research topic? What are you going to do your dissertation on? And I said, I think I'll do it on women in rodeo, uh, actually rodeo queens. And he said, rodeo? Oh my god, Buffalo Bill was here, and our cowboys beat his cowboys. And I said, really? That's the first I'd ever heard about it. So when I got home, I checked into it, and sure enough, 1890, Buffalo Bill's tour to Italy. There's a big competition. And according to the Italians, their cowboys won. And according to the Americans, our cowboys won. And so they've continued to agree to disagree for you know, a couple hundred years, well, at least over 100 years. So since that time, here we go. Um, every time I go back to Italy, or every time since then, I would ask people on the street, you know, strangers. I'd be in a cafe, and I'd see someone who looked like they would talk to me, and I'd say, you ever hear about Buffalo Bill? Um, and I was stunned by how many people actually knew about Buffalo Bill, actually knew about the, the, his tours to Italy. And I was also surprised by how many people in the US don't know about that. But um, I wanted to, to use this information, this, this insight, into um, a story. But I wanted to turn this, this story around. Rather than explore why we don't know about Buffalo Bill, I want to explore the ways in which the ideas of the American West, first introduced by Buffalo Bill, had influenced Italians over time. How the, 
that influence manifest itself and how the Italian interpretation of the American West then said something about what they think of, it, of Americans. That's kind of a lot of knitting to do, um, but let me first show you where, we're, where I'm talking about. So when I'm talking about Buffalo Bill coming into, um, into, the, uh, into Italy, this is uh, Cisterna Latina. That's where he had one of his big shows that made the most influence. Uh, when I talk about Volgara later on, that is right up around here, right oh, by, by Alessandra. And his show in Trieste was over here. And so the, the words that I'll be using, Butro is the Italian cowboy or herdsman, Butri, of course, plural, and La Sfida is the contest that everyone knows about between the two cowboys. So like I said, this is a lot of information to try to knit together into a cohesive story. And so I decided on a theory uh, called transnationalism um, for making sense of it. And I love these images. And um, you know, here we have one of my favorite Far Side cartoons, uh, cowboys out in the West drinking, having espresso. And this image right here is taken in Italy at, a, at the Cowboy Guest Ranch Saloon. So here we've got this woman who looks like she could have just walked out of any, uh, any you know, bar here in, in Wyoming, um, and she's holding the little espresso cups too. Um, but anyway, transnationalism um, is a fairly new theory. It emerged in the 1990s as a way to study uh, diaspora groups, you know, like, like Jewish immigrants who, um, in social fields that cross geographical, cultural, and, and political borders. But since the 1990s, the framework has broadened to include studying the movement of ideas and people and goods, like coffee, uh, between countries, which is very fortunate for my purposes because in terms of cultural analysis, this is a useful way to understand how people in a nation uh, balance their identities against one another and what those identities might be. And it allows me to explore how various aspects of culture, such as the idea and the use of the cowboy image emerge in the US and Italy, uh, and how they're shaped over time, both within their countries uh, and by the exchanges that have developed between the countries. Uh, so in short, transnationalism is gonna facilitate the study of what I call an evolving dialogue or a reciprocal exchange of a cultural icon in which both sides contribute. Now, in my talk today, I focus on one aspect of this project, the impact that Buffalo Bill made in Italy during his first European tour, and how in Italy, the memory of Buffalo Bill and the American values and ideology that's wrapped up in his image uh, becomes his most enduring legacy. Now, when Buffalo Bill crossed the Atlantic in 1889, uh, and he took his Wild West show overseas to perform in front of crowds of spectators throughout Europe. What's really interesting to help put this into context is this is during um, a new phenomena of huge spectator events. So this is part of the era of modernity that, that we have these large cultural gatherings. And um, when he went to Europe, he. Uh, or to London for his first trip, he came up with a rather brilliant marketing strategy. He piggybacked his Wild West shows onto shows that were already being widely advertised by someone else. So he went to the American exhibition, did very little advertising for that because he didn't have to. He had captive audiences. Uh, the Queen's Jubilee, same thing. And um, during his second trip, he honed in on these strategies, also dovetailing his Wild West shows with other large events, but he used a new technology. Well, it was new at the time. Um, posters. And, and by using the, the high -tech, this high-tech form of advertising, he was able to create months-long advertising campaigns, which created enormous anticipation in the towns and the cities along his tour. And this is important because this new technology allowed for a mobilization of cultural and ideological resources on a scale that had been unimaginable until that, uh, not so long ago. Um, 
Do you want me to translate some of this? Okay. The Orient, or the East and the West reunite. Uh, and he's, and the, uh, the sport, uh, the military sport of the ancient Japanese reconstituted from a, a in a platoon of uh, horsemen on the, oops, I can't, I, I'm going to read it from here, I can't read it from that there, um, from the ancient nation, nation um, the imperial troop of Makoto. Also, more than a, a century, more than a hundred of it, uh, American Indians, real redskins, um, the America from the time of the pioneers. And so he's really capitalizing on this frontier uh, imagery. Now, um, so, and when people came to his shows, they loved them. I mean, they absolutely did not disappoint. And for years afterwards, memories of cowboys and cowgirls and, and Native Americans remained topics of community conversations. And these stories of the shows were often treated like prized family possessions when they would tell them again and again to one another and pass them down through the generations. Silvio Ruteri uh, was one of the people who saw a Buffalo Bill show in Trieste. And decades later, he, he was talking to a historian, and this is what he said. Buffalo Bill took us to the world of the cowboy, the Indian tribes, the redskins. It was a whole new world for us that we would eventually see reflected in the pages of adventure writers like Salgari. Um, and up until the late 1990s, adventure writers were still making um, graphic novels about Buffalo Bill. And here, his show formed a wonderful reality because it brought before us a fantastic world and that was superbly coming true in absolute naturalness, corresponding to the real habits of the people of the West. He was smitten. This guy loved it because here was the West and it was absolutely real and true. Um, well, it's kind of an uncritical view, but um, it's an important representative view because uh, you know, the overall lack of knowledge about the American West among Italians, you know, really does help explain why Buffalo Bill so easily came to personify the, Amer the Wild West for Italians, and then by extension, why the West came to represent for them the whole United States. Now, it's kind of unlikely that uh, Ruteri had never heard or seen of the West before. Um, you know, Authors like uh, Robert Rydell and Rob Crows write that when Buffalo Bill, um, uh, excuse me, that uh, when Buffalo Bill went over to the West, or to Italy, he clearly encountered in Europe a world alive with images of the American West. Not through painted images, because the uh, Europeans still had a rather low opinion of American art at the time, but instead they saw the West through a new type of technology, photography, that had emerged in 1839. Now, um, in the United States, photography generally centered on images, uh, portraits uh, taken in studios. But in Europe, the uh, real, real emphasis was on landscape and um, vacation photography. They wanted, Europeans wanted photos that showed all the exotic places of the world. And uh, John, or David Haberstitch writes, it is clear that many 19th century Europeans were interested in the North American continent, both in terms of its natural wonders and apparent exoticism, as well as the ideology and mechanisms of its fledgling political system. Many were so interested that they immigrated permanently others visited, still others did not travel to the New World, but demanded images of it. Here's an image of Carlo Gentile. Uh, he was one of the Italians that moved to the West and provided people back in Italy with stories and images uh, of both the land and Native Americans, particularly in the Southwest. But he wasn't the only one over there doing that. Um, Immigrants escaping the economic and political difficulties, first from the north of Italy, later on from the south, um, uh, and who moved permanently to the United States. 
And then the birds of passages, those Italian laborers who moved back and forth uh, between the U.S. And, and their homeland, also were quite likely ones uh, to provide information and images about the American West back to their families in Italy. Now aside from seeing uh, photos, members of the Italian upper class could always read about the U.S. if they chose to do so, um, but the majority of Italians were illiterate and quite poor and they had very little access to information about the U.S. or the West. Italian historian Tiziano Bonzani argues that their understanding of the U.S. was generally based on superficial knowledge, which gave the perception of the U.S. an ideological and mythical quality. So Buffalo Bill's arrival in 1890 then brought the West to Italy. And by doing so, but with his physical presence there, he brought into focus all those very vague perceptions of the region to Italy. He brought to life, he actually personified for them um, the West. And the impact of his shows helped focus these discrete images and vague thoughts into a more concrete conception of the West and gave Italians a tangible expression of the people and the values of the newly conquered frontier. Now reflecting on the influences of Buffalo Bill in the United States, Joey Kaysen writes that American identity was founded in the Western experience, the triumph of conquest of wilderness through virtue and skill and firepower. Buffalo Bill promoted that identity in Italy as well. Kaysen also notes that Buffalo Bill's fingerprints are still found all over our culture. And he generated fingerprints in Italy as well. Not necessarily identical fingerprints, but selective adaptations that, uh, of the American West that has still persisted. Now, one of the most important events that have helped keep Buffalo Bill's memory alive is the event known as La Sfida. And during the stay uh, a little south of Rome, uh, Cody was always talking about how great his cowboys were. And the Duke of Sermonotta um, took a little bit of offense to this because Cody was saying, our cowboys can beat any cowboy in the world. We can beat Italian cowboys. And the Duke was saying, well, you know, he's really kind of dissing my region, my cowboys, and their tradition and honor. And so finally the Duke said, well, let's have a contest. Now, of course, this is exactly what Cody wanted because if you have a contest, it's a lot of advertising, brings in a lot more tickets sales. Uh, and so they had the contest. Um, and the Duke brought wild colts from his estate, apparently beautiful black young stallions. And, uh, and then they, they had uh, a great advertisement uh, thousands of people came to watch. In the Rome newspaper, La Capitale, it described the, the reaction to the, to, the, uh, to the competition, the first competition, this way. Um, the, the American cowboys did very well. The public sprang to their feet as one person, applauding them and cheering them frenziedly. It was a beautiful victory, since the Colts, conquered by the strength of the rider, after having tried a thousand efforts for liberation, came to a stop like lambs. The American cowboys actually did so well that almost immediately Italian celebration turned to serious consternation. Um, another Roman newspaper captured the sentiment stating, the victory of the Knights of the Prairies goes down badly with the coachman, the butteri, and many others. Italians began to wonder rather uneasily just how well their cowboys could do against um, these Americans. And so within a few days, a new contest had been arranged. 20,000 people came to watch this second Sfida. Now, it's the second contest that didn't go so well. According to the Italian newspapers, eight butri from the Roman countryside presented themselves as Buff at Buffalo Bill's arena, bringing with them wild colts. They saddled and mounted two without the same aids used by the cowboys. And by aids, he's meaning uh, lassoing the, the colt's feet and, and putting blindfolds on them before they saddle them. They were ready to take the third colt to the party when Mr. Buffalo Bill intervened, saying the contest was over. Now this brief description here illustrates the two points of contention that develop. 
uh, the American method of handling the Colts, which Italians thought was simply barbaric, and confusion over a time limit. And so a new battle begins, but this time it's in the newspapers over who, who really won. Now, according to the Italian newspapers, the Butri obviously won. Uh, they argue that since Cody had, had not announced a time limit before the start of the, con you know, the contest, his arbitrary demand to stop was a sham and victory remains to the Butri always and for the ages. And then the uh, Italian press went on to describe Cody as a buffoon, a cheat, and a swindler who ran away without paying his debt of honor. The American papers took a little different approach. Um, they argued Cody's writers won because, of course, the time limit had been clearly stated. The Italians just ignored it. And um, for reasons best not inquired into, Cody, uh, the Italian presses had been from the first inimical to Cody, writing things both libelous and scurrilous. The debate continued. But each side, of course, being, being um, kind of a tradition of the era, wrote poetry to celebrate the victory of their cowboys. This is really awful poetry. Um, and uh, no, it's no wonder that it's not in any anthology. Um, for no one in Rome, whether absent or present, from the highest in the land to the lowliest peasant, their wild horses could tame, ride or astride, until Buffalo Bill's boys dashing came along, putting it at once all other horsemen to shame, and along with the breezy coolness of the western slope, tame them at once right in front of the Pope. <laughs> kind of a ha-ha, we, you know, we won. Now, of course, the, the Italians had a different version, and um, this is a translation that I came, that I came up with. Uh, my aunt uh, and I both tried to find out what a bifolceto is, but we couldn't. Uh, and so what the women of the, the way that this poem is set up is that Buffalo Bill is standing in the streets of Rome after this big contest, waiting for, for all the women to come, all the young pretty girls to come and just swoon at his feet. Um, and instead, the girls pick up the, one of the butri, butro, and they carry him over his shoulders and they're saying, a little butro or something like that is what I want. Uh, I, basically, I would rather eat peasant food, bread and garlic and salad without vinegar or oil, and have the honor of being with my hero than pay any attention to that smarmy Buffalo Bill and his cheating ways. Now, for Italians living along the western regions of Italy, um, especially by Cisterna, Latina, up in, toward Grosseto, um, La Sfida has played a real large role in keeping the memory of Buffalo Bill alive. It is in these cities of Cisterna and Grosseto that the history of the, the event is still celebrated. It's taught in elementary schools, there are museums to Buffalo Bill, archives, and um, it's even still considered a viable subject for movies. A friend of mine who lives in Cisterna um, wrote to me a while ago and said that they're putting together, they're making a new film on it. Uh, I think in this film, the Butri are also going to win. Um, <laughs> I'd be happy to go over, uh, you know, as a, as a consultant, but I don't think they would listen to me. Um, but this is a direct legacy of Cody's tour, of course. Yet throughout Italy, uh, the impact of to Cody's tours linger too. In his introduction, not only an American myth, uh, written for a retrospective of the 1906 Wild West show in, in Trieste, Paul Fees wrote, for the major part of the people, Buffalo Bill symbolized the Wild West, and at the same time, the Wild West represented America. And Italians remember him. Some like um, Rutero, as the man who introduced the real, authentic, absolutely perfect West to Italy, as well as the values that Buffalo Bill presented along with the show. Others have appropriated the memory of Buffalo Bill for political uses, to bolster national or regional pride, or to commodify the image of Buffalo Bill, to market and sell as a business. Whatever their, their uses of his memory, though, over 100 years later, um, 
the Wild West that Cody presented to Italians, his fingerprints on the, the Scotty jar, uh, remain. And they provide fertile ground for exploring the evolving idea of the West that takes place outside of America's borders, especially in the areas of Western fashion, Western writing, and Wild West shows and rodeo. Uh, I just want to start with a, an image of Italian butero clothing. This is very traditional um, style and, it, and uh, they, they wear it today still. Uh, that being said, Italians loved Cody's clothing and his sense of style and um, his bella figura. And newspapers had all sorts of accounts of his of his splendid sartorial elegance. Um, his unique American garb, the buckskins and the fringe and the holsters and the leggings and everything, helped really define and project American Western values. Uh, and, you know, and, and, it, and the writers in the newspapers were not shy to admit that it projected a sense of sensual masculinity. Um, and they liked that. So again, you're seeing these Italian cowboys, the Butri, with their own distinct style. And their style is going to express, visually express, their status as the top of the hired hand hierarchy on a large landowner's hacienda. So in a society where perceptions of status are still very carefully managed, the fact that elites did not immediately flock to their tailors and order you know, buckskin jackets uh, isn't really that surprising. You know, why indeed would an Italian duke put on the clothing of a hired hand? Um, a better question for them would be, why would people who could afford better wear the garments of a cowboy? And I'm going to take a little tiny digression here because uh, two of my colleagues from the University of Teramo were staying with me uh, in Hastings College a few years ago. And they were working on a, on a project looking at um, expressions of high culture that are made popular. So, so for example, um, Edward Mon Monk's The Scream, you know, that's high culture, but it's on t-shirts. Or using um, Mozart for your ringtone, for your, for your telephone. So taking high culture and making it accessible to the public. And I said, and I had just gotten back from Fort Worth, and I said, well, you're kind of missing a point because in America, anyway, we have something called faux low pop. I invented the term. And I said, it's where people who can actually afford better dress like cowboys and cowhands and cowgirls. And they are absolutely stunned by this. And actually, I wrote an essay for their, for their journal on what I called faux low pop. Um, and, and the idea that anyone who could afford to dress well would actually choose to dress beneath their status. And so this was very, very disconcerting for the Italians. And again, you can understand why Western wear does not take off for, for quite a while. So um, while in the US, again, wearing Western styled clothing has crossed class lines for a long time, you know, from presidents to plumbers, stockbrokers, and you know, academics, um, that trend took a little bit longer to catch on in Italy. And when it did in the late 70s, it had more to do with designers like Ralph Lauren catering to a wealthier clientele than any um, challenges to the status quo. In fact, uh, it now supports the status quo because it takes quite a bit of money to dress like a cowhand. Now, I first became aware of this, um, this trend, the, the design influences of American West in Italian fa fashion, on that trip with the family in 2000. Um, we were stunned by the, the dresses uh, for women in the, in the shops that looked like Miss Kitty meets Valentino. You know, and they were, uh, there's fringe, but it was very, very, you know, revealing. Um, even nowadays, this trend continues. In Italian pop fashion, for example, you see fringe and calico and, you know, the yokes and denim and leather. And still, the clothing is a little bit more revealing that, than what we, you know, very prudent Americans would wear. Um, and there is still that association through, through wearing bits of the West that identify with the West. And I know you don't believe me, so I'm going to show you some stuff. Um, this is hard to read, but this is an image for the um, MSC Marlboro Classics brand. 
um, unlike in the late 1880s, Western wear has become, as I said, self-conscious status marker for high-end Italian consumers. And the Valentino Fashion Group is a fashion house based in Milan, perhaps best known for its haute couture and an edgier international style. But in the 1980, or 1980s, they introduced this leisure section. Uh, and I'll read it to you because it is difficult. Uh, it says, our brand story, mix an American heritage with refined Italian style. So a great brand came to life, a unique, authentic, and original blend. A rich heritage and wealth of inspiration with consistent Italian refined quality and style. Combine the brand with the rider icon, this guy here, uh, to build an international brand consumers love, trust, and respect. An outdoor inspired, casual, and classic brand for real men. Uh, offering um, quality, sturdy, reliable attention to detail, craftsmanship, and contemporary design. American heritage, Italian design. And the advertising continues. Um, Italian know-how meets American lifestyle. And again, they're reflecting back to the, the uh, imagery of the West, the values of the West that, that Buffalo Bill first brought over. Um, emotions, intense harmony with nature, um, you know, they are collections where the American dream comes through the spirit of adventure, the spark of courage, the love of challenges. Um, the Italian models never look happy. Um, <laughs> I don't know why, but you know, here there, you know, this looks like clothing that you could see really anywhere here in the U.S. But they're very consciously making that connection between the West, the values of the West, and and style. Um, she's got a lovely belt buckle there. This is a gorgeous skirt and uh, blouse with a beautiful leather belt. Um, probably puts you into three figures easy. You know, so it's not just anyone who can buy this. Again, they're catering to the very high end. Italian male models don't look happy either. Um, <laughs> this guy had the same expression. I was wondering if they were using him I mean, just like a cut and paste, you know, like those old paper dolls. Um, but again, you know, th they're reinterpreting, reimagining the West, as, as we often do here in this country. Um, again, harking back to those old values, um, the, the rugged and refined wardrobe um, that, these, that this, this clothing represents. Um, this image here, or this uh, collage comes from a recent men's magazine, Italian men's fashion magazine, and the theme for the issue was masculine plural. So they had images of, of many men, but this one really caught my eye. It includes, again, this spread on Western men, uh, and this young man is from Oklahoma. You know, I was looking at the images and going, wow, Formica. Italians don't have Formica on their countertop. Where is this taken from? Oh, it's Oklahoma. Okay, that makes sense. Um, but really, the, uh, the very, very brief east, uh, essay that goes along with these photographs and the beautiful simplicity of these photographs allows the readers to um, fill in the story with their own preconceived notions of the American West, the one that was made real by Buffalo Bill. Uh, and it focuses on those characteristics of you know, masculinity, self-reliance, the virtue of hard work, uh, in a region that's not yet tamed. Even those with more modest means can indulge in this uh, self-identification with the American West. Uh, in January of 2012, I was over in Florence. Uh, Florence was hosting the International uh, Fashion Exhibition at the time. And uh, so I was walking through one of the little side streets and I saw a consignment shop. And it was full of Western clothing. And I went inside, and it was all Ralph Lauren clothing with some American Western saddles, tack, you know, blankets kind of tossed in and about for the design. And uh, the owner happened to walk in, and I asked him, I said, why all these, you know, why are you focusing on Ralph Lauren? 
And he said that Ralph Lauren had done so much for the Italian fashion industry that it was his tribute to him during the fashion exhibition that he would sell only Ralph Lauren clothing in his shop during the exhibition. Now, investing in a Western shirt or a hat uh, pales in comparison to becoming involved in Western writing. Going back to that transnational framework, uh, this is where it becomes very useful since it encourages an examination of economic transfer that often accompanies cultural transfers. By the early 1970s, Italians had recovered in pretty good measure from the World War II. They had been watching Western films that the U.S. had sent over to, to Europe uh, for about 25 years. And uh, the idea of the West had, had become very much a part of their, their lives. Um, now, be, some Italians had become very wealthy. And uh, a gentleman by the name of Signor, um, uh, oh, excuse me, where's his name here? Arcese. Um, could bring the American West to Italy by going to the United States and purchasing American quarter horses to take back to Italy with him. Uh, according to David Avery, who is international director for the American Quarter Horse Association, international interest in the organization began in the light, late uh, 1960s, and Italy became one of the first to actually set up an, an international affiliation in the 70s. Um, you know, again, the popularity of breeds through the movies, the Western lifestyle, and the romance of, of being a cowboy encouraged individuals like Arcese um, to live his dream by bringing the West to Italy. And so he brought uh, top quality horses from the U.S. for breeding, for showing, uh, and for starting his own um, stable. Other Italians traveled to the U.S to train with uh, top-notch reining and cutting uh, trainers to purchase the horses and take them back. And um, in doing so, they helped to concretize and popularize the dream of living the Western lifestyle. Uh, by 2011, there are 23,000 registered quarter horses in Italy and 25,000 registered humans. Um, so it's a very large organization in there. And it's really interesting because if you're taking the train through Italy, which is how I travel, and you're going through this beautiful countryside, you really don't see many animals. Um, their farms, their ranches are much smaller than what we have here. And they tend to really um, protect them. The animals are kept inside for uh, most of the time. But you'll find these, you know, these gorgeous stables and these gorgeous training centers in places like Rome, right, right in the heart of Rome, where they've car you know, carved out space. Uh, and again, this is very expensive. So this is an area uh, of exchange that I've only really started to delve into. But you know, preliminary evidence suggests that the transnational economic um, impact is really quite large. And again, you're you know, when I look at these images, um, they looked like, you know, you could be here. It could be down in, uh, you know, at the, the Cow Palace in, in Oakland or anywhere. But uh, you have to know how to speak Italian, really, to converse with these people. And, uh, and I think their horses respond to Italian, too, now. Now, one thing that I found just fascinating um, is the uh, development of Wild Ro West and rodeos in, in Italy. I mentioned earlier, indulging in Westernness can be pretty expensive, and those class distinctions still remain. Uh, the people who participate in the high-end sport of Western riding, of cutting and reining, distinguish themselves from the rodeo crowd that emerged in the 1990s. Uh, and the rodeo folks, too, see themselves as a distinct and separate group. Rodeo was brought to Italy as a means of introducing a more accessible way to take part of what many considered to be the real, Itali uh, the real Western experience. So dressing up in thousands of dollars of, of, of uh, riding apparel and, and having a $20,000 horse and uh, just doing reining and cutting, that's not the real West. They wanted to do and engage in real Western activities, roping, bucking horses, um, and uh, you know that sort of stuff. 
So, you know, and um, the way that Rodeo came to, to, uh, to Italy is kind of interesting too. There was a, a man named uh, um, uh, Bucteri, or excuse me, Charles Besseret, who grew up in France after World War II. He um, would always go to the movies that they showed on Thursday after school. And he just became smitten with the Westerns. Uh, and he wanted to be a cowboy. Well, when, by the time he turned oh, 22, 23, he decided that he was going to become a cowboy, a rodeo rider, a bucking bronc rider. So he got a three-month pass, went to uh, Arvisa, went to the United States, got a three-month greyhound pass, and traveled all over the West. And he ended up at the end of his stay in Pecos, Texas. Uh, he said he got off the bus. It was about 6 in the morning, so he went over to the, the cafe next to the Greyhound bus stop, and, and he had you know, basically no money. He was just getting ready to back, go back home to France. And these um, ranch owners were there for breakfast, and they saw him, and according to Charlie, they fell in love with me because I'm French, uh, which is probably true. And they took him out, one of the ranchers took him out to their place. They gave him, you know, uh, a job as a wrangler. And uh, that began his, his very long stay in the United States, learning the rodeo business from the competitors and all the way up to the producers end. And in 1992, he went back to France with the intention of starting rodeo in, in France, in his home country. And he connected with a very wealthy investor. They had their first rodeo, um, and it didn't do really well. I mean, it, the ticket sales were okay, but you know they had invested millions in bucking horses and chutes and everything it takes to put on a rodeo. Um, and so the investor was getting a little bit nervous, and Charlie convinced him to do another show in Milan. And this is where the Italian connection comes in, because the investor was pretty much done with this whole experiment in rodeo. But Charlie and Carlo Riccardi um, got together and they decided to, to start a venture. Um, and it was going to be fairly typical of an Italian venture. It's going to be a family business. Uh, Carlos would be the, um, uh, the one who, who uh, ran the arena. Uh, his wife, who had run a, a lingerie shop with her mother for years in, in Milan, would uh, do the gift shop, run the gift shop. And uh, her brother would take care of the, the education part of it. And of course, Charlie would, would um, do the, do the, run, the, run the Wild West show. Um, now, the Italians had less interest in, in becoming rodeo competitors than, in, uh, you know, than they did for the, uh, developing a successful business. And Carlo Riccardi was interested in this idea of a Western business uh, because he had gone to the, to the U.S. a number of times. The, the only two places in the United States that exist for Italians, that's New York City and the West. Um, there is nothing else in the United States, just those two places. And uh, when he was in the United States, he really admired how children could become involved in sports in school. You know, in Italy, there are only very expensive club sports. And he thought that by starting um, this Western venture and having it a real emphasis on children and bringing them into the sport would be great. So the business, he thought, would combine his love of the American West, its sense of freedom and adventure and outdoor, activity, act, outdoor activities and horses with competitive sport that encouraged people of all ages and genders to participate. And they also used Cody's idea of educating while entertaining. One of my very favorite Cody um, poster quotes is, history blended with pleasant instruction for all the people of the land. Actually, that's my teaching philosophy as well. Um, and so they presented rodeo events in the form of a Wild West show to both inform and inspire their audiences. So spectators would be introduced to the excitement and the rules of rodeo events, and hopefully some of them would be encouraged to take up the sport. Um, again, with Bessier, with his years of experience, made the perfect partner for this. And, um, and Roby, uh, Ricardo, uh, Riccardi's brother-in-law, took it on himself to really focus on the, on the education portion. 
And so he developed outreach programs to, to elementary schools, encouraging teachers to combine lessons on the American West with a trip to their theme park. Um, he designed that curriculum for the uh, elementary teachers because, quite honestly, he said, they don't know anything about the West, uh, and they don't teach the West, which, if you think about it, it's not really all that bizarre because how often do we teach about it? Italy in elementary school? But anyway, um, and so this, this lesson plan for the children is um, in the form of a newspaper. It looks like an old Western newspaper, with the old script, you know, style script. And it uh, has information on famous Western people, uh, events, facts, pictures of animals found in North America. And so when the, the students and the teachers arrive at the theme park, they've had a primer uh, on the American West that helps them make sense of the Indian villages that they see, the rec uh, recreated cow towns, the buffalo, uh, the cattle, the horses, and other farm animals. Now, Riccardi and Bessier hitched their, their wagon to the belief that the memory of Buffalo Bill and his Wild West show still remained strong among the Italians, and their belief paid off. The Wild West show uh, regularly sells out. The amusement park brings in thousands of visitors, not only from Italy, but also from France and, and Germany. And there are busloads and busloads and busloads of little kids that come to the, to the theme park. Uh, they developed a restaurant, uh, and it serves American West-styled food. It features Nebraska beef. Um, they've got a great saloon that you know where guests can get dressed up in their Levi's and and um, Wrangler shirts, and they can toss back a few buds while they're getting you know the courage to sing karaoke to Western music and or try to learn to do the two-step. And once a week, they bring in. Uh, Western bands to, to perform country music. So between um, that and the rodeo school and that beautiful indoor arena, uh, it helped to create a dedicated and growing group of competitors. And as word's gotten out, has gotten out, um, expat Am Americans, uh, and for a large part, uh, young men from the West who are stationed in Germany or Trieste, uh, kind of find their way into the Cowboys guest ranch orbit and they find opportunities to compete or begin their own training schools. And I know as I'm telling you this, you probably think this is so weird, you know, but uh, it is in a sense. And here is um, a video. Uh, this is, if you can't see it too clearly, it's a scene of uh, Native Americans getting ready to go on a, on a war mission. If you'd like to ask me more questions about what's all in this Wild West show, I'd be happy to talk about that um, later. And these are a few images that I took while I was uh, over there. Um, and you can see that you know, they really emphasize a lot of the American aspects of culture. When you, when you arrive at Cowboy Guest Land, land um, it's an interesting mix of English and Italian. Um, but you really do feel like you have stepped into a little tiny piece of the American West um, right there in the, in the heart of northern Italy. So to wrap things up, um, the images of the West may have swirled around in the imaginations of Italians before Buffalo Bill arrived, but his presence focused and crystallized those images. He personified the American West. He became the visual embodiment of the positive values needed to survive in that region. Strength, endurance, hard work, and an independent spirit and grit. And he left those fingerprints all over the, the uh, imagination of Italians. So over a century later, the direct correlation between Buffalo Bill and the American West has remained firm in some areas of the country, uh, the Marema region. 
where school children are still taught about the contest between Buffalo Bills Cowboys and their Butri, and in northern Italy uh, as a springboard for establishing a business at the Cowboys Guest Ranch. And during my last trip to the Cowboys Guest Ranch, um, Roby mentioned that they're going to build a, a new dining facility, a new dining room for special events, and they're going to call it the Buffalo Bill Dining Room. And I asked him uh, if visitors really remembered Buffalo Bill as a person. Um, and he said, well, many do. Uh, for many, though, the uh, Buffalo Bill just kind of stands for that you know, generic cowboy because his image has been engulfed by silver screen cowboys and Marlboro men and, and male models and flannel shirts. But whether they remember the myth or the man or just a cowboy image, the substance of what Cody represented in the idea of the American West he brought over and the values represented in this exceptionalist view of the West continue and they sustain interest in the West. But again, rather than criti uncritically adopting the American view of the West, Italians have appropriated what suits their needs uh, for political or economic or personal reasons. And while it appears to some, uh, like Matt here, uh, who have embraced the lifestyle completely, or as completely as is possible while still living in Italy, others have fit their use of the West um, to their own ends. Uh, by competing in Western riding, astride American horde <coughs> horses, by participating in rodeo, um, by taking their children to see cowboy land, or asserting a reckless attitude by wearing a Stetson. These are the remainders that the, of the Western ideas and the values Buffalo Bill promoted in 1890 that are still visible in contemporary Italy today. And, uh, you know, uh, can we turn the lights down just for a second so we can look at at Matt. When I first met Matt um, on my first trip to Volga, his name, he went by Massimilio. He's from Milan, only child. When I came back a few la years later, he had changed his name to Matt. <laughs> and if you look at him, he, you know, he's a handsome young man. Uh, and I said, really, Matt, why, why, why have you become uh, an American cowboy? And he said, you know, young people today were really very disappointed with our political system, with our government, with the economy. Um, and he said, we're wrapping ourselves in the mantle of the American West because the West represents opportunity and it, re it represents a sense of adventure. Um, and so they have, in a sense, um, created their own reality, their own American West where they can live what they perceive as a real life, rather than being subjected to the, the lunacy of their economic system and their political system today. Um, and doesn't he look like he could just be on any Wyoming ranch? <coughs> he does. Uh, his English isn't so good, though. <laughs> but thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take any of your, your questions. Yes. Uh, some of the most popular Western movies in the United States were actually the Clint Eastwood movies that were made in Italy. Oh, the spaghetti westerns, yeah. And I just wondered if they liked those movies over there. Oh, yes. And going back to um, uh, Buffalo Bill, you know, when, when Americans were starting to get tired of Westerns and you know, all that, you know, very clean image and everything, um, they, they created this grittier more ambiguous Western hi hero. And Buffalo Bill featured in the first two uh, Italian spaghetti Westerns. So they were, again, using him as a springboard to get into more, uh, you know, for, into different things. But yeah, they, they like, you know, they like everything really Western. Um, some do, and some, you know, there's a, an Italian student uh, from Genoa at the University of Wyoming now, and, and we get together once a week and so I can practice my Italian. Um, and, you know, this is where it's interesting to see that people outside of uh, Grosseto, Marema, um, really don't know much about their own country's history. Um, they don't know who these cowboys are. But they do know all about John Wayne. <laughs> and they do know about Clint Eastwood. Yeah. Yes? How many people, both cowboys and Indians, were in that show? And did he take his own horses? 
uh, Buffalo Bill. He did take his own horses. I'm not sure exactly the size of, of his show. It's really quite large. Uh, I do know he contracted with the uh, tribes, uh, especially the Lakota tribe, to bring Native Americans over. Um, but it was a big event, yeah. The Wild West shows that they do today are a little bit different um, than, well, it, no, I'll back up a little bit. They're trying to show rodeo, they're trying to promote rodeo, and it's been very successful. Um, but the rodeos and the Wild West shows that they are putting on are very much like Buffalo Bills, where it's a package event. So uh, there, there's a woman that, that owns the Wild West show, and she has all the horses, all the costumes, um, all the bucking stock, all the bulls, and she brings her show to uh, Volgata, uh, and there are also three or four places um, in France and Germany that, that she takes her show as well, but it's packaged. So when I was gonna ride in the, you know, the grand parade, you know, the, uh, I wanted to actually ride the horse that I was gonna be on before I went galloping around the, the, the arena. And um, the owner wasn't there, but I asked one of the riders, I said, you know, can I just hop on one of the horses? And they said, no, oh, these aren't our horses, these are her horses. And we don't know if you can ride, you know, we don't know if, you, if we can give you permission, we're not, you know. So I didn't, um, which was very disconcerting the next day. Um, we had a little bucking thing going on in the middle of the arena for a while, but that was okay. Um, but, you know, the, they do have Native, uh, Native Americans riding. Only they're French people because the French are darker complected than others, and so um, they look more French, more exotic. And they're not, they're given instructions, don't talk to people because we don't want you to dispel that illusion that you're really an Indian. Um, so it is very much a show, the way that Buffalo Bill set up his show. But by having these shows and by um, explaining, you know, the bucking events and, and what's going on in Western history during this fictitious time, you know, that they're in the, in the arena, um, people have become very interested. And so there are uh, uh, schools for calf roping. Uh, there are enormous uh, number of people who do team penning. Would you, you know team penning? Yeah, okay. And, um, and bull riding. And so it's, and barrel racing. Women have gotten into barrel racing. So it's spun off from this night idea that emerged in 1995 to be a real, um, real rodeo community that's developing in Italy. Let's thank Renee Lake one more time.